evening and welcome to the Tuesday, December 9th meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. Uh, the school board is the first new meeting of the new board and the board members were sworn in last night, so welcome to board member Barbara Powers. Thank you. And Joe Morrissey was also re-elected and she is unfortunately unable to be with us tonight. Um, the board met uh, by charter as it's required to, to for organization and so we have a nomination for board chair. Yes. Do we have a nomination? Yes. For board Do we chair? have a nomination? Yes. I would like to nominate Joe, Joe Morrissey for chair in the spirit of never miss a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> for... Is there a second to that nomination? I second the motion. You don't do the pledge of allegiance. Thank you. We will return to that once we finish the motion that's on the table. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, David. I did underline it. <laughs> David is reminding me that I neglected to, con to do the Pledge of Allegiance, so we will return to that in short order. Um, so we have a nomination on the table for Joe Morrissey for school board chair. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, is there any discussion on the motion? Okay, I'd like to call the vote. All those in favor of Joe Morrissey as school board chair? Vote is 6 0. In the absence of the chair, I would like to call for nominations for vice chair. I nominate Kate. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Are there any other nominations for the position of vice chair? Seeing none. The vote on the position of vice chair. All those in favor of Kate Williams Hewitt for vice chair? Did you not vote? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the vote is 6 0. So again, in the absence of the chair, I would like to turn the gavel over to Ms. Williams Hewitt to Thank conduct you. the meeting and our first order of business, I think, being to return to the one I missed, which would be the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would like to take a moment to recognize um, John Christie for his work on behalf of all of us in the chair and Joe, uh, Joe as well. John, I wrote something so I wouldn't just wing it for you as a thank you. Okay, here we go. Um, I'd like to thank John Christie for his two years of leadership as the chair of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. John is notorious for his thoughtful, um, his thoughtful responses regarding all district business, either seated in a meeting or over coffee with a citizen. I believe John has only been able to pull off his hard work. Um, I, I believe John has only been able to pull off this work by uh, working extremely hard and I would argue that you've done the 10,000 hour rule with your work on the school board. You still have a year at least to go. Um, here are just some of the few things John will be famous for. Looking at the school budget line by line. The mission and vision statement, the adoption of the strategic plan, by always staying child focused, by responding to citizen questions with facts taken from policy, the school handbook, and school law, yet always considering citizens' point of view in committee meetings with, and with administration, teachers, and school board members. You not only have studied what we need to study here at the school board, but you've also taken our, everyone's point of view into matters and bring it into meetings, which I just think is excellent. You know, you're multifaceted in your um, approach to leading the board. I've learned um, that when John says, I met a father who said 
but I should lean a, bit, a little bit closer and listen to John because it's usually a powerful statement. When John says, I, meet a, I met a teacher who thought, or when John says, um, I thought this article was interesting, how could we make this happen? Um, John has always been thinking and moving the district forward with small, thoughtful actions that, that they don't take up a lot of space. He just goes about and does his business and all of us benefit from that work. So thank you and your family very much for your dedication over not only the last two years, but of course the last five years. Thank you, Kate. I appreciate so it. So we have a gift for you, but we'll give you that after. Thank you. Okay. Still going. <clears throat> so I move that we approve Michael Moore as finance um, chair. Can you say this good that? And if you can continue with the policy nominations as oh. well. We'll take that as one motion. Okay. So I move uh, that for finance, um, for, for finance, Michael Moore, for policy, John Christie, David Hillman, Barbara Powers. Keep going. And John is chair. John is chair for policy, yes. And then David and Barbara Powers as members of the um, policy committee. So you need to know if there's a second. We'll vote on that motion first. Is there a second? Michael? Is there any discussion? Seeing none. Can I have a, um, a vote? To all those in favor? All those in favor. I move that we approve committee appointments for Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation, Barbara Powers, for the Maine School Management Associate, uh, Association Delegate, Barbara Powers, and Kate Williams Hewitt as alternate delegate, for past General Advisory Board, Susanna Mazel Hubs, for Wellness Committee, uh, Kate Williams Hewitt and Barbara Powers will share that committee. For Technology Steering Committee, Michael Moore. For tran Transportation Appeals, Kate William Hewitt. Building and Grounds, Michael Moore. Teacher Administration and Evaluate Teacher Administration Evaluation, Kate William Hewitt and Susanna Mazel Hubs. As advisory committees. We're gonna stop there. Okay. We're gonna ask for a second. Okay. Do I have a second? Yes. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay. Next is I move that we approve the advisory committees, the legislate, legislative liaison, Barbara Powers, as dropout prevention committee, John Christie, as community service advisory board, David Hillman. And as the on the innovation team, Susanna Mazel Hubs and John Christie. Do I have a uh, second? Michael. Any discussion? All in favor? Phew. Back to the organizational meeting, and I will say it's, it's very unfair to have to step in as vice chair at the very first meeting and, and you. run an agenda. So, <laughs> thank you. Well very done. Much. Okay. Adjustments to Are there any adjustments? Seeing that there are no adjustments to the agenda, I don't know. Ask. Yes. You can ask. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? <laughs> none. Seeing none. Item three. Item three is, um, could I have a motion to approve the school board minutes? David. <coughs> I move we approve the school board minutes as set forth in the attachment to our agenda as three sub, uh, section 3A, B, and C. Is there a second? second. Any discussion? Seeing none, we have a vote. Mm -hmm. All those in favor, that's the line. Okay, you guys. As item number four, comments by student representatives. Would you guys like that? We have the middle school representatives here. 
Hello, I'm Piper Strunk. And I'm Julia Thorak, and we're the seventh grade representatives. We are here to talk about what's going on in the middle school. The week after winter break, Free the Children is hosting a futsal tournament. Futsal is like soccer, but it is inside, and it is smaller. The ball is also made so it doesn't bounce as much. Seventh and eighth graders are allowed to join, and they will make their own teams. Each kid on the team will bring in $5. All the money is going to country, countries in need. The Stuff the Bus. The Stuff the Bus, as you probably know, is where students and teachers are asked to bring in non-perishable items to stuff the bus for people in need. It wasn't going as well in the beginning, but with help from former members of the student council and students from the school, we ended up collecting over 1,500 cans. That is a very big accomplishment for us. We helped a lot of people in need. Um, winter sports have started, and I know for girls basketball, the season is almost over. The um, middle school Nordic team started in December, and even with the limited amount of snow, they're still out there practicing. And the boys basketball will start up after break. There will also be alpine skiing, indoor track, and swimming. The 2015 production of uh, the 2015 theater production is Oz this year. Signups have already started. The winter production will begin in late February. Um, the middle school has a bunch of band concerts coming up this week. The seventh and the fifth or the fifth and sixth um, grade chorus and band have a concert tomorrow, Wednesday, December 10th, and the 7th and 8th grade band and chorus concert have a concert Thursday, December 11th. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the students? Uh, no, but I, I would just say thank you for coming. It's been a long time since we've had middle school representation at a school board meeting, and we really, it's great to hear from you. So thanks a lot for, it's great to see seventh graders too stepping up and, and, and taking that leadership. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can I just ask one quick, the first fundraiser you mentioned, can you yeah. tell me again who that's, who you're raising money for on that first one? Um, we are raising money for Stuff the Bus. The one oh, the first before that, yeah. Oh, we are actually raising money. It's a program called um, Free the Children, and um, we are going to try to help countries in need. And part of what we're trying to do is we're trying to raise money to buy these soccer balls, oh. which contain like something in it that uh, creates like electricity and power to power like flashlights and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But the soccer balls cost a lot of money, and by doing this fundraiser, we're hoping to raise enough money to buy soccer balls to send them to these countries in need. That's awesome. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Um, Natalie, do you want to share anything? Um, so I think <clears throat> last time we met, it was November 18th, and on November 19th, we had the kindness guy come to the high school. Uh, which was really cool. He gave about an hour-long presentation to the whole school. Um, and I think a lot of people had seen him talk a couple times before, but um, he gave a different presentation from what we'd previously seen. It was just, I think it was really, it was really awesome. Everyone loved it. Um, and he hung around all day um, just talking to the students. And I think it was a really special day for the high school because it was, a lot of people were kind of wary of like, oh, the kindness guy, does that sound like it? assembly that I really want to go to, but it was actually it was actually really, really great, um, and I think everyone enjoyed it. And then last Friday, we had our, um, our second TEDx youth event at the high school, and the theme for this one was Emerge. Uh, we had 10 to 12 outside speakers, and then a student speaker and several student performers, um, and that was an all-day event for the juniors and the seniors, and then the freshmen and sophomores had the opportunity to watch it like live streamed in the library or come in and watch one or two uh, talks in the auditorium and I think that was a huge success. Um, I know there's a steering committee that's been working since the beginning of the school to get that all figured out and they put a ton of work into it and it was really successful so that was a lot of fun. That was last Friday. And yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> Any questions and comments? I agree. It was amazing, the um, TED event. And I'm sure Meredith, you'll talk more about it. 
as well as the concert. Were you in the concert last night? Oh yeah, there was also a band yeah. concert last night and, and a chorus concert, right? Yeah, and the, chorus. Yeah, the, the chorus was amazing. Yeah. Um, it was outstanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very talented. And the chorus is growing, which it's amazing. It's just great to see. There's actually, um, it's growing. It's great. Okay, um, communications. Jeff? I'm start with number five, just comments from the public. Oh, oh sorry. Are there any comments um, from the public? I think you're our only public. I thought your sister did great. <laughs> yep. Thank you very much. If you guys want to go and do homework, um, now's a great time, but you're welcome to stay. But Julia, if you'd like to stay to hear your dad, he's up next. <laughs> Thank you. I thought the TEDx conference was amazing. Thank you. Number six, communications. Jeff, would you like to share? Good evening. So originally the plan was to have the volleyball team come in and uh, so we could have this opportunity to celebrate and recognize their state championship. But with the weather, we thought we would postpone that to another date and um, that way when we really originally had made the uh, plans um, we weren't anticipating the lovely weather that we're experiencing right now so we will do that hopefully in the next meeting or two coming up at some point so I thought uh, I would use that time to kind of just provide a little synopsis of uh, a very successful fall season, um, one filled with numerous individual and team accomplishments, uh, fantastic weather, uh, a new gym floor, and um, as I mentioned, some very competitive teams, and a great senior class. The first and foremost, that weather this fall was just phenomenal. Uh, I've always said that the venue, our venue, overlooking uh, the marsh on Hannaford Field is, is just brilliant in the fall and maybe one of the best, uh, definitely the best in the state of Maine, and I would rank that right up there in New England as well. Uh, so with our volleyball team, I'll start with volleyball. The won the Class A, Class A State Championship, uh, which is um, schools were the smallest school in Class A, so that ranges from 550 to um, almost 1,200, I think. So uh, we're playing some of the most experienced and um, established programs in the state, and it was quite an accomplishment for, for the girls to, uh, to win that state championship and do it all three playoff games in five game sets, two of which were from two games behind, so uh, they really, it was just a joy to see the poise, um, the joy, the, te the, the camaraderie of this team was just exceptional, and it's really been a, uh, a special t moment for me as well. This is my seventh year here at Cape Elizabeth, and the program's eight years old, so to see it grow and to see that success um, is, is really special, and we're really proud of their accomplishments. So. Golf, uh, our golf team was in the state class B uh, championship. They were the runner-up. Uh, they were also the Western Maine Conference champions. Reese McFarland, just to highlight, um, four-time Western Maine Con Conference golfer of the year. So a freshman right up through senior, and uh, that's really rare, especially in a sport with golf, and, and the conference that we play in is very competitive, and uh, that's quite an accomplishment. Girls cross country finished third at the state meet. Uh, they were also third at regionals. Had a first place finish in the Western Maine Conference meet and a first place finish at the Festival of Champions in Belfast. And there are 58 teams competing there, nine or, and about 700 individuals. So that first place uh, finish was was fantastic, and we're really proud of their accomplish accomplishments. Boys cross country had a third place finish at states third place at regionals, fourth in the Western Maine Conference, and I'd like to recognize Mitch Morris, had two first place finishes, one at the state meet and one at the regionals. Field hockey team had a quarterfinal appearance, and I have to say this is one of the most skilled 
teams that I've seen in quite a long time. They're, the quality of play and the level that they were playing at uh, was exceptional. The, to see that played on turf is, was just it was a, amazing. The, 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 the quality was just far none. Um, I mean, I think their win percentage on turf was up to 75%. I think to see the purity of that game, it's played on turf. Um, and they, were, uh, they certainly demonstrated that. Football also was in the quarterfinals. They had a, a tough loss to Yarmouth. One of the highlights for me was earlier on in the season, and um, they were playing against Levitt. Levitt ended up playing in the state championship game. And I'd say they were at least, and this may have been one of the, it may have been one of the most exciting football games in, rec in recent history anyway. There were at least five lead changes in the last three minutes. Um, and, then, and then Noah Wolfinger threw a 60-yard um, Hail Mary pass to Ben Ektal to tie it up with like seven seconds left. They ended up winning in overtime and uh, had another game similar to that against Yarmouth during the regular season. And so I think the papers had um, provided that, the Cardiac Capers, the nickname, which later went to the volleyball team. So they both shared that, uh, that nickname, which was kind of funny. Boys soccer, uh, they had a tough loss against Greeley in the semifinals, uh, played probably in some of the worst field conditions I've ever seen. Um, and they just, it was one of those days where just things didn't bounce their way, and, uh, but they, they had an exceptional season. I think some of the highlights, may, one may have been Coach Raymond's video. He did a video interview to all the, all the players on the team. I think there were like 34 players showed that at the um, banquet at the end of the season. It was one of the highlights. And then Timmy Brigham's uh, goal, he's a goalkeeper. This is his first year playing. Ended up playing a forward position, ended up scoring a goal on senior day. And uh, it was just truly fitting and, and, and a neat moment for him and for everyone else there. Girls soccer was uh, Western Maine regional champions. State Class B runner-up. They lost a heartbreaker to Waterville, who they beat last year. Um, with this team, another team that really demonstrated a high level of play and a lot of quality. Um, what strikes me most was how they experienced quite a few injuries throughout the season, and how this team persevered through that was uh, quite an accomplishment. And it really, some players were in roles that they had never been in. Some players were in different positions. Um, I think just a true testament to uh, not only our, the girls, but the coaching staff as well. And uh, congratulations to them on, a, on another fine season. Sailing had an impressive eighth place finish at the Great Oaks Invitational Regatta in New Orleans. And that is a national event. So Eighth place, it's an imitational. Um, great to see. Also, Cape Ultimate, their fall league state champions. They also played on that same day. Uh, the boys' soccer played. It was freezing temperatures, pouring rain, played all day. And um, kudos to the, to the Cape Ultimate team for persevering through that. So just to highlight a few things. We had 17 Western Maine Conference senior all-academic all-stars, 27 Western Maine Conference all-stars. Coach Beckel, Sarah Beckel, um, three Maine Coach of the Year. Not, so it was the Maine Volleyball Coaches Association Coach of the Year, the Forecaster Coach of the Year, and the Maine Sunday Telegram. Um, just remarkable and so proud of Sarah and the work that she does with, with the girls. Also should note Tess Haller on her main Sunday Telegram um, Volleyball Player of the Year. That was just in Sunday's newspaper. Uh, Lydia Brenneman, Tess Haller, Mitch Morris, Reese McFarland, Griffin Thorak, Montana Braxton were also uh, main Sunday Telegram All-Stars. Two conference championships, two runner-up state Two runner-up in the state in the state champs, and then uh, one state champion. Uh, just for a small school, the great things that our kids are doing—it's uh, it's really really impressive. And especially when you take a, a minute to step back and think about 
um, all of these accomplishments and, and the good things that they're doing and in addition to the stuff they do outside of the community, the stuff they're doing in school, um, really neat and very proud of, very proud of the, uh, the teams this fall. Any questions, Please. comments? Jeff, I'd just like to thank you. Uh, I love it when you present to us because you're uh, so passionate and you can tell, um, you know, you have the same attention and commitment to, to every sport. I think the fact the volleyball program grew under your leadership is a great example of always looking to expand uh, opportunities to, to different students. So I really appreciate your passion and your leadership. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much. I would just like to say um, the, the students that were hurt this year and couldn't play, I know that they still sat on the bench. I believe a lot sat on the bench and were still part of the team in spirit and that not everyone always gets to play for different reasons, but still being part of the team and um, it, it's as equal as playing and it brings us, it's just fabulous. So I appreciate um, your work. Thank and you. that you go to most of the games and that you make sure it's safe and that the kids are uh, not only good sportsmen and sportsmanship, but also um, respectful to the other teams and the community. Thank you. So I did tell the baseball coaches 7.30, so. Awesome. Oh, I thought. I have to at least so they will be here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Meredith. Okay, so the superintendent's report, I'm going to start with a couple of items from the high school. First, I'd like to recognize um, high school speech and debate coach and drama coach and teacher Dick Mullen on his recognition with a third diamond degree in the National Speech and Debate Association. That signifies that he has earned more than 130,000 points through speech and debate um, presentations, competition, and service. And so he'll be receiving a plaque at the National Speech and Debate uh, Tournament this coming spring. I also want to acknowledge a grant that was received by the high school um, from the Sprague Foundation for the School Counseling Office, and that grant is um, going to support an Applications Academy next summer for um, incoming seniors in order to help them get everything in place yes. for the college process. And I um, want to congratulate um, Brandy LaPointe and Belinda Snell for their work on putting that application together, and we appreciate the support from the Sprague Foundation. Uh, Pond Cove received a grant from C for $6,500 for a first grade project on Portland Headlight and intertidal pools as part of the 250th anniversary celebration. And Maine um, educator Carol Steingart, who works with Coast Encounters, and um, Sarah Herboldsheimer, I think I got that correct, uh, will be there as an artist in residence as well, and they'll be working on an interdisciplinary project with first graders in the spring. K-4 classes are participating in the National Hour of Code, um, led by tech integrator um, and teacher Tom Chartre this week. And, and they're learning the foundations of coding and its relevance. And the exciting part of that is that next Tuesday evening, there will be a Coder Express celebration at Pond Cove at 6.30 to 7.30 in the Pond Cove Middle School Cafetorium. So there will be iPads supplied with Coder apps already on them. There'll be hot chocolate and the Polar Express theme, but for coding. So please wear your best you know, Polar Express attire. You can come in pajamas. You don't have to bring your own iPad, but you certainly can if you choose to. We'll help you download the appropriate apps, um, but it's a great family opportunity to, to learn more about technology, and we, there will be support available from our district technology staff. That's great. Um, the middle school also received a grant from CEIF for its makerspace, so I know that um, Principal Tracy had scheduled a meeting for this afternoon with his makerspace team at the middle school that was postponed due to the inclement weather, uh, but that will be rescheduled and they're hoping to get that space launched um, early in the coming year. <coughs> I want to circle back to the TEDx event that Natalie described a little bit earlier, and I want to thank um, parents Sarah Lennon and Mary Townsend, um, teacher Betsy Nielsen in particular, but also um, teachers Lauren T Tarantino and Ginger Raspler for their support in pulling the work together, as well as um, uh, the student organizers and Principal Shedd for their work. It really was a tremendously successful event, um, which included some great student performances, a wonderful array of speakers, uh, including a uh, very 
powerful um, talk from student Hunter Kent um, that concluded the session. Um, it also incorporated, the, that afternoon incorporated an auditorium full of dancing people, um, juniors and seniors in high school, as well as the adult community members who attended to the main marimba performance, but it really, uh, I think the day ended on a very high note, and the feedback that I've heard um, from the debrief sessions was very positive and enthusiastic and um, impactful, so that's an exciting thing. And the videos of those talks will be available, I think, in late January. So we'll, we'll keep you updated when those go online and we'll put a link on our, um, both our Facebook and our district homepage. Concerts, as um, again, <laughs> we've already discussed, are going on right now, last night and um, later this week. Um, Coder Express evening next week. We had two teacher professional days back in November right before the Thanksgiving break. And again, there was very positive feedback about those days. I think staff really appreciate the time the sustained time, um, being able to work on um, the many, many um, projects that lay before them um, to include curriculum work, some vertical curriculum work, um, work on uh, preparing for the Smarter Balance Assessment, uh, just a variety of, of topics. And some, there was some self-designed work as well as some, some opportunities for folks to um, partake in um, sessions on topics that they had described as being of particular interest. So some on technology, some on differentiation, understanding by design, um, a variety of topics. So I want to um, thank Ruth Ellen Vaughn and the building administrators for their work in coordinating those days and um, look forward to next year's professional development days. The teacher evaluation committee, about half of that committee attended a workshop last week at the University of Southern Maine with teachers and administrators from across the state. And um, that work is ongoing in the district, but I, I, I think it was a helpful conference for people in a lot of ways, gave some good ideas, and um, I think will help people continue with the work that, that lies before us. This Thursday evening, the booster organizations will be meeting with representatives from Maine, uh, representative from Maine Municipal Association regarding liability. I know that's a concern that has come up periodically in the past, so it's an opportunity to provide some clarification to what is exactly covered under the district insurance policies and um, things that booster organizations may want to watch out for. And thanks to uh, Jeff Thorak and our business administrator, Scott Wyman, for coordinating that evening. Today was day two of um, several differentiation workshops that are going on this week and next week. Again, um, those being a vehicle for helping us move forward to reach our district mission and vision by focusing on the learning needs of all of the children in our schools. Um, one anecdote that I heard today from a sixth grade um, teacher was that she was so excited with this unit that she was working on planning, but the greatest piece for her was that, oh, she now had an audience that had developed as a result of being part of this training. So not only had she designed the unit, but now she had an opportunity to go and present it in the preschool because she had had the opportunity to have some dialogue with one of the preschool teachers who was there. Um, so again, I think the importance of having teachers be able to work together in K-12, um, despite the time out of classroom, is, is well worth um, that cost. I think, I think there are a lot of gains for teachers in being able to collaborate effectively across K-12. Uh, we start our preliminary budget meetings at the district level next week, so it's always an exciting time, but <laughs> um, again, a tiring time for our administrative team who are working to pull that together um, as well during this very hectic time of year. And mm, I will be out of town the next couple days at the superintendent's advisory council meeting for the college board. Um, those meetings take place Thursday and Friday, so I'll be um, tomorrow and we'll report on that at an upcoming meeting. That's it. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Any comments or questions? One more that I forgot. Great. It's the big flyer sitting right in front of me. Um, which is just a reminder that on January 7th, we'll have a um, book group discussion of how children succeed. And that will be held at the Middle School Library and Learning Commons. That's open to any interested community members, and copies of the book are available at the public library. Um, you can also download an audiobook from the public library or from your favorite bookseller. That's great. Thank you. Um, let's see. Number seven, new business. Do I have a motion? Could I have a motion? Yes, I move uh, that we approve the Cape Elizabeth High School baseball team trip to Vero <coughs> Beach, Florida, April 16th through the 22nd, 2015. Second. Any discussion? 
Should we um, ask the... So I can start, and then That's if great. there are questions. Um, in your packet is a description of the proposed trip, and there's a fair amount of detail in there, but if, if there are questions, um, the representatives are here to answer. Are there any questions? Just a clarification. I'm looking at the schedule. I imagine this is during spring break. Yes. Is that there's correct? no school so on April 16th, and the following week is school vacation. And it has, I know for most of these, uh, you know, the cost looks like it's funded by the families and students. But for, for students that uh, can't afford it, what, what options do they have and how can they participate? Well, I'll introduce uh, Paul Godfrey is our, our baseball booster rep, and Andrew Wood is the varsity baseball coach. So I'll, I'll let them kind of assist with, with your questions. They'll have better info on the specific details. So take it away. <laughs> to answer your question, one of the things we did when we started planning for this a, a, a while ago, we made sure that when the announcement was made, we made sure to reach out to folks and understand whether or not uh, you know, the choice to go or to not go was, was, was not a financial one, as we've done with other uh, things in the boosters in the past. We've always made sure that if, if folks were not able to afford it, that we reached out to folks and, and offered opportunities. Um, to be honest, nobody has uh, reached out to us in terms of not being able to, to, to fund this. Um, you know, and we do, have a, we do have a great cross-section of folks who are able to and have chosen to attend this year. Thank you. I had a couple questions. Um, there's a question on here, and it's, I want to make sure that it's, I understand what, does everybody have an opportunity to, to participate in going on this trip? Everybody mean from freshmen to seniors that it's on the baseball team, or is it limited? We only offer it to the sophomores to the senior group. What? So the incoming freshmen that haven't met yet. The, the, the reason for that is, is, is twofold. Um, one, in, in discussions that Andrew and I have had dur during this, the intent is that the, the group that's going to go or, or looking to go to Florida uh, is more of a, of, of a varsity focused group. Um, and the other reason is, is that hopefully, as has been done with the baseball program in years past, we are hoping to make this a recurring event. So for folks that would be coming in, uh, such as the freshmen who wouldn't be going, or you know, not designated to go this year, there would be other opportunities to go. So you said varsity focus. Is every, from, let's forget the freshman, is every sophomore, junior, and senior that's on the team allowed to go if they want? Yes, every, the opportunity has been made available to every sophomore, junior, and senior in, in currently in the Cape Baseball program. Okay, and um, I don't, I'll, I'll, maybe you can help me share. I, I don't know, when I was in high school, which was you know, only about 10 years ago, but um, there were limits on when you could do preseason. Uh, is there any kind of these uh, limits? And are we in compliance with it by the spring trip? Absolutely, yes. Uh, planning for this began during the baseball, the, the, the true baseball season, which began in, in, in late March of last year and ended, ended sometime in the summer. So uh, again, as stated with Andrew, we've done a fair amount of planning, you know, right up through till the time the, the, the technical season ended. Uh, after that, myself and other members of the baseball boosters uh, have been responsible for the planning elements of this, uh, coordinating with uh, the parents and the players, uh, coordinating with the, with, the, with the folks who were, who were going to at Dodger Town and Vero Beach. Uh, again, as we, we're, it's very clearly stated in the rules, Andrew cannot have any uh, contact or coordination with the kids during that time. So all of the other, during the time when it's not in season, we've been the ones, the boosters, who've been coordinating with the, with the, with the players and the parents. Is the actual trip um, within the allowed time frame? Is there any? Yes, the, the actual trip begins, I believe, April, I'm going to get it wrong. It's, it's the Thursday before um, um, April vacation. Uh, that's the, 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 we, the, the players are currently scheduled to leave that evening on a flight down and they come back the following 
uh, Wednesday. Uh, the actual season begins the third week in March. Is that correct, Andrew? Correct. So, so the trips within the Maine Principal Association rules. Right. And I'm just curious, and I have no knowledge whatsoever. Is it permitted for, even though the coach is on, it seems sort of interesting that boosters are allowed to do it. Is it is that permitted by the rules? The boosters are allowed to talk to people, whereas the coaches aren't? Yes. Okay. Yes. In fact, um, there are a handful of uh, other schools from the state of Maine who are actually going to Dodger Town as well, and the same, uh, the same process is being followed by those, by those schools as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I guess I have a question about, um, like, as the policy comes through. So we're pretty close in reading the policy about field trips. Mm -hmm. The price of the pro uh, one parent can exceed, I think the number is 1400 um, and you've written 1300 Correct. Um, have we... What's going to happen if it exceeds that? Uh, there's another, historically, did I read that it was more expensive? I thought I read a $1,700 trip in the past. Yeah, we changed venues. So we were going to go to Disney World, which was uh, the higher end, and we ended up not going because there was one, one other team going during our time period, which was Scarborough High School. So it didn't make sense to travel that far to, to play that. So we looked at a different venue and it was uh, the Darter Town and Yarmouth High School's going in seven other teams. So just, and it was, uh, I think I believe 1,200, 1,300, which was definitely better for us. Yep. So you've read the policies and are following all the policies as the school board writes so that? Yes. Well. Yes. Yes, we're, we're obviously very sensitive to cost. Again, trying to be as, I'm, I, I tend to be frugal by nature, so again, just trying to be as, as, uh, as cost effective as we can in our trip planning and our trip coordination, being again, being very sensitive both, both to the policies and, and for the parents who are paying for it or the kids who are paying for it. So my other question is always about, um, can you tell I spent last year, a couple, last couple years on policy. Um, what happens with the kids if there is an incident? What's your... Um, how have you talked to the kids about if there's incidents where they're not following got rules and they make some choices that aren't um, within the appropriate um, field trip and policy? Since Andrew's the one to go on, let him speak to that. In our planning discussions during the baseball season, um, we were very clear to the kids. You know, certainly this is a trip that is a privilege. Uh, this is a trip that, you know, you're going out of state, you're representing Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, you know, Andrew and I have had numerous discussions about appropriate policy, um, you know, making sure the kids are aware how they, how they represent themselves, how they represent their town. Um, you know, Andrew and another coach will be going, uh, monitoring the kids as well as several parents, but um, I know how you are in the practice field, so I'm, I'm, right. not, I'm, not, I'm not worried about the kids, but I'll let you speak to that. Yeah. Um, I think the, the group of kid that, kids that are going are, are, are we wouldn't be taking them if they weren't, weren't going to treat the school or, or the way it should be. Um, we would f follow the school policy. Um, if someone was to make a, set, a mistake, then that's, that's not okay. Um, and I guess the, the, the reason why I bring it up is because there is such a big expense and so you're going down and not all students are going with their parents. So if there's a red, you know, if someone has crossed the line, yep. a person might choose to um, not follow the policy and keep the, keep the student with them rather than sending them home yep. um, because the added expense is so great. Yep, actually that's, that's a great point. Part of our prior planning to the actual event will include discussions with both the players and the parents regarding policies that need to be followed, what happens if something goes along, um, great example, you know, what happens if something happens, you know, what happens if to that student, we'll cover that, you know, and again, I think certainly depending upon what the potential issue could be, we will make sure that that, you know, that that element is, is, is covered as part of the planning, you know, we're, the kids will be very, they're very crystal clear, I use kids, I, I call my 18 year old son a kid, um, the players will be very clear as to what their rules and expectations are and they, they will be very clear in terms of understanding that there's really no exceptions to that. Thank you. 
Can I just yes. add? See, it's, it's not unusual for our students to be off campus for trips, and while coaches have the immediate responsibility, consultation is certainly always available from our administrators to include our athletic director and um, building principal. So if there were to be an incident, they're in the position to make the immediate decision, but they certainly have the support of folks back here um, to help them work through a, a difficult situation. And those do occur from time to time. Yeah. When we work with adolescents, they sometimes make mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, uh, typically that means if it's a significant enough mistake that they are sent home, and it's clear in policies that that's at their expense. Good point. Barbara? I was just going to ask from policy, there's a statement on here that all Chaperones will have volunteer training. Is that in policy? And would you amend that to say they will have volunteer training prior to the trip? Is that the, on the, this form? It's just not checked off. So I was just curious. Yes, the the, the, the two technical chaperones that'll be going will be Coach Wood and and and, and one of his assistant coaches. Um, mm -hmm. But to be clear, I think what Barbara's asking is other is oh. it the parent chaperones will have also attended district volunteer training, and I think. Many of them have attended that in the past because they've volunteered for the school district over a number of years, yes. but. Yes, we will make sure, haven't figured out exactly who, who, any, who any of the parent volunteers may be, but very clear that they will have taken the volunteer training to make sure, so thank you. Yeah. Be good just to have that checked off as a matter of record. Yes. Sure. Okay, um, any other questions? Okay. What is the phrase is? Could I? All those, uh, all those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I keep forgetting I have to talk again. <laughs> so. Seven D. Seven D. Could I have a motion? I move that we approve the proposed 2015-2016 academic year calendar. Thank you, John. That's provided in our packages. I second. Any discussion, conversation? Meredith? So this draft was provided um, originally back in late September. Uh, calendar meeting was scheduled um, and opened to district staff for late October. Um, there are as we discussed back in September, this calendar was developed in conjunction with the other PAD spending districts in order to meet the requirement that was um, re-articulated to us in person this fall by the Commissioner of Education, um, in requiring us to, no, to have no fewer than five similar calendar days. And as a group, we made a tremendous effort to comply with that, given all of the individual district needs. Um, so this calendar is a reflection of that. The comments that I received um, from faculty pertain to two areas, one being a request to attempt to move the no October 9th workshop day to the 13th of October in order to reduce um, the number of interrupted weeks in October, because as you can see, due to the workshop day, um, the Columbus Day holiday, and teacher conferences at the end of October, you had three consecutive weeks of interruption. Um, Unfortunately, due to the needs of the other PAS sending districts, that's not a request that we're able to accommodate. Um, the other request um, was regarding um, early release days. <coughs> and early release days are not um, currently built into the model calendar that we had shared. Um, and so if that is something um, that the board would like to entertain, my recommendation would be that we not adopt the calendar tonight, but rather bring a draft back to a subsequent meeting so that there's time for people to view that draft and offer comments to the board. Thank you. Any <coughs> questions or comments? I, I um, did you get my email, Meredith? Yeah. Yes, I sent a Trying to, oh, I didn't, I, sorry. Okay. Probably didn't get back on in time. I was just trying to, um, there's 175 student days in this calendar. Correct. And, and how many teacher days are in the contract? There are 183 days in the teacher contract. Okay. Um, for our K-8 teachers. So eight professional days beyond the student days. days. Okay. Um, two of those are utilized as comp days for conferences. Yep. Um, 
two are used, well, I'm going to separate into K-8 and high school because the days are distributed slightly differently. At, um, at K-8, teachers have one day's worth or the equivalent of one um, professional day's worth of professional Mondays. Those are, those are, those are the 70 minute blocks that they have after school. Mm -hmm. They have three days prior to the start of the school year. And we know, for example, that in the upcoming year, at least one of those days will be devoted to teacher evaluation and some training around the teacher evaluation model and rubrics. They have two days that are comped for conferences. And the remaining two days are um, the professional workshop days currently scheduled for October and January. At the high school level, they have two days prior to the start of the school year, two days for conferences, two professional Mondays, two that are the equivalent of professional Mondays, and the two workshop days during the school year. And the high school had requested the additional professional Mondays due to the NEASC work that this is their uh -huh. self-study year and next year is their visitation <laughs> Lucky year. Lucky you. <laughs> so that's just the, the creative use of paid professional time, essentially. Okay, thank you. Marriage, what was the, um, the issue with um, half day or early release? So before my time in the district, so I can't speak to exactly um, you know, how that time was utilized here, but before my time in the district, the district had early releases on a monthly basis. So students were dismissed a couple of hours early from school, allowing teachers to have that time, the remaining time in their work day to work together collaboratively on district initiatives. So to work on curriculum development, um, technology integration, whatever, whatever the topics um, on the table at that time were. And again, that was something that was, and I know there was a survey done um, and some feedback collected, again, prior to my arrival, and the calendar was redrafted, and those early release days were not included in the calendar at that time, have, have not been included in the calendar since, but um, that was a request that was made um, from faculty, and that does not affect the PATHS days, the dissimilar days for PATHS. Um, we did put in last year, and they continue into this calendar for the coming year, um, two early release days um, in February and April, but that is not certainly a monthly um, release. So has there, there's been, because um, it's a balancing act, obviously I can see the value of early release days for teachers. For parents, it can be extremely challenging, especially for those who uh, both work. Um, so your comment on, you, you've received some a request to look at, you know, having more early release days. Yes. And that request, I imagine, is, is from teachers. It came from teachers at the elementary school. Okay. And how does that work? So if you have more early release days, how do you make up those days? You they count. They, yes, they're not, they're not days that you have they to make up. So example, days. when we had our late start last week due to the snow, um, that's not a day that we have to make up. As long as you have a, more than a half day essentially and you're serving lunch, it counts as the equivalent of an instructional day. So it wouldn't be a make up for instructional time, but certainly there is a balancing act to that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. And just as a context, uh, how many in, over the last, how, how many early release days were scheduled, you know, this year? Is, is there are only two scheduled in this current academic year. Right. So they weren't, they haven't been scheduled on a monthly basis in my time in the district. And then this one has three early release days. This is the orange I'm box. I'm sorry, you're correct, there are three. There are two that are for professional development, the others are for conference days. Okay. Um, does this make sense for Kelly to speak on? I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but to speak on behalf of, it, was it formally done um, with Kelly? Would you have any input from the teachers? I guess what, what I'm thinking is um, it takes a long time to get feedback and to pass. This needs to be passed by... There, and there's not a, a ticking clock on the calendar development. I mean, I think it's certainly people appreciate getting it sooner rather than later as they make plans with their families. And um, you know, it, it's helpful to have some lead time to develop your schedule. But again, if the board wants to have a con to entertain the idea of early release days, I would suggest that you charge us to look at that and that we bring that information back to you and that you not take action on the calendar tonight. 
Well, I guess my question was, I do remember in the past we have gotten questions from um, students who have said, can you tell me when the calendar is because I'd like to plan camp, camps and everything else. So I, I do know and maybe right before you came, those came in, we haven't had them since. Um, so I would say if the early release days are something you want to look at, it doesn't impact really the calendar at large. It certainly impacts parental planning and that, you know, if you have younger children, there's a, there would be a need to examine child care options and there are certainly some other ways we can think about um, using early release time. But I would say if, if this is something you want to look at, um, we would need to have a discussion as an, as an administrative team. And again, this was a request that came recently, so there hasn't been an opportunity for that discussion, but we would need to look at how to build those in, what the best frame is. Is it best to do early release or late starts, which would mean students come in a bit um, later in the morning. And um, again, I would think we would want to put that information out for parents in order to receive some feedback. I guess that was my point too, is that I can see um, putting this into a poll, unless Kelly has anything um, right up front to say, and putting it into a poll for next year because the work on the calendar has been done and it, it takes so long to get really good feedback from parents, so we might have some polling questions. Um, that we could come up with and get a good poll. So, unless Kelly has, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I can relay, and you can certainly jump in. I mean, I, I think what we hear are our elementary teachers have the least planning time of teachers K-12, and that's not unique to Cape Elizabeth. That's true generally in the education profession. And I think at a time when, you know, there there are so many um, state mandates that teachers are juggling, and you know, with a new assessment system, uh, the district initiatives that we're looking at, I think our elementary teachers are feeling overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, I don't think that yeah. that yeah. should be a surprise to any of us. I think you know, that in general, teachers work very hard and have a lot on their plates. So I think that's the impetus for the request. Yes. Um, okay. but, yeah. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah. yeah. Come on up. Yeah. I'm sorry. I usually put Jeff on the spot, so I'm sorry to. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you gave me a gavel and everything tonight, so. No, I'm happy to speak for a moment. Um, and I think Meredith said it um, said it well. I mean, the elementary um, staff has the least amount of planning time, but I think what really helps us with the early release time is some sustained time where we can really roll up our sleeves and get a lot of work done. We, we, know we definitely appreciate the after school time that's built into the calendar, but when you know, that is at the end of the day, we have even on the 70 minutes time, in this time, you know, it's, it, whether, whether the early release time is at you know, a, a 1.30 or a 2 p.m. time, it still gives us a sustained time where we can even work you know, two, three hours um, and really devote chunks of time that are, you know, the, the topics that, me that Meredith mentioned. Um, we have so many things, you know, and we want to do them really well. And so I think it's the sustained time, like the, the two November professional days were really used well. And we felt that people felt like they got a lot of really good, deep work done. And so, um, and so Meredith's right. It really just came up in a discussion yesterday. Um, teachers had not given a lot of input and then felt badly that they hadn't. And so then um, it got into a discussion about, is there any way that you know, perhaps this could be revisited? And so we appreciate the opportunity to, to perhaps open, you know, reopen it. Um, so. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? No, I'm, I don't have a question for Kelly. But okay. John, yeah. any questions for Kelly? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if, if you're asking for more time to consider the, the, the requests around early release days from Pond Cove, I would, I would certainly support providing that time so that all the thought that needs to go into the calendar can go into it. Um, I have a, a, a different calendar-related um, question because I hear this um, regularly from, from parents. You, you, you happened to mention to me before the meeting that um, seven hours of sleep is now the, is, is the, new, the, new, the new eight hours. Um, 
uh, in terms of b being a healthy amount of, of sleep, um, but there's a lot of research that says that particularly uh, teenagers uh, struggle with the early, early start to the day. Um, can you speak m briefly to the, the issues that lead us as a district to a 755 start for the high school in particular? Um, because I know that's challenging for, for students at that age. So I'm actually going to ask Principal Shedd to come up and, and add into this conversation because I know there was a discussion held in this district not that many years ago when the high school start time, which used to be closer to 7.30, was moved to 7.55 and there was a great deal of discussion about why 7.55 was the best time. And, and I won't remember all the specifics about this, but <coughs> for a long time when I, when I first came it was 7.30 and then we actually moved I'm going to guess about seven or eight years ago, we actually moved to almost 8.30 um, for two or three years. And it was largely based on exactly the kinds of concerns, John, that you're raising in that research. Um, we had, and I don't remember the specifics, but I know we had considerable pushback against that from both parents and students um, who thought that it was really disrupting the later part of their day and that they actually preferred to come back, come to school a little bit earlier. Um, and one of the things that was happening, and it still happens to some extent, is when we push the start time to 8.30, uh, what happened is more and more and more of the athletic, not, not athletic teams, but extracurricular groups started meeting at 6.30 and 7 o'clock in the morning uh, because our kids tend to be so busy. So part of the things that was happening was we were really defeating the purpose um, of what was originally intended to do. Um, so that's interesting. Okay. So I would just say I think some of the trends that have emerged recently because I would say CAPE is not unique in being tied to this relatively early start to a school day, which sort of defies what research says is optimal for students, but some creative ways that districts are getting around that challenge is by offering more of a flexible day so that there might be courses offered after school or into the evening. Um, teachers teaching those courses might have a different day. They might work 9 to 4 instead of 7.55 to 2.25. But that presents some challenges as well because not all students are available, but, but those are some alternatives to looking at changing the start time for all students. Just a, a piece of history as well is that we merged the bus routes. Um, that's why it came back to 7.55 because the middle school and the high school buses to meet the budgetary needs of the district. Yeah, that was tight. Yeah, somewhere. So yeah. There was considerable pushback from... Yeah, oh yeah. I, the most surprising source of pushback was actually from students. Uh, yeah. Because they were getting up anyways and meeting at 6.30 a.m. Yeah. It creates as well, I'm pretty sure I have this, I have to think this through, but I'm pretty sure it made our compatibility with paths even more challenging as well. Oh, that was a minor, in the grand scheme of things, in terms of the number of people involved, it was relatively minor, but it, for that group of students, it had a significant impact as well. Thank you, Jeff. Um, if I could throw in two cents, I would, I would, um, I agree, Meredith, that if folks are told start and end dates and vacation dates, if we took an extra month to hear back from the leadership team about an early release proposal, I'd be open to that because that wouldn't impact. And I'd also be interested to know if community programs can support early release. I know a moon ago they used to. I don't know if that's still possible. And they have done that for us when we introduced the early release days for February and April. Mm -hmm. um, they offered specialized programs to be able, and they do those on the conference days as well. Right, because I am sympathetic to how that is for, for many, many families. But we're, there are a lot of districts in our sort of um, comparative group that have every long week at early release. And, and the amount of work they're able to get done, Portland, Yarmouth, um, 
Scarborough, to name a few. Cumberland has had an early release Wednesday as long as I can remember. So it's, it's, a, it's a really viable way to give, as Kelly says, said, sustained time. I'm guessing the high school would welcome it. I'm not as sure. But I'd like to hear from all three principals if they think that would be useful. Thank you. All right. So, so we can keep... table the motion, or you can vote. Um, <coughs> I, uh, I, vote, I prefer to table it. I think um, if we approve it and leave it open-ended for early release date, people get busy. So I kind of like the idea of having a deadline, so then we can have some feedback on early release where if we don't it may you know get pushed back i do if also want to hear uh, i see the benefits of early release day professional development the trade-off is those are less hours students are in the classroom so i would like to see there's always a cost if there's a benefit so mm -hmm. i'd be interested in learning how to balance those factors so i, I would propose tabling the motion Um, this deadline. People, in, we, we heard next month. Well, is that sufficient amount of time? The only the challenge break. will be that we have limited time yeah. prior to the two-week break. Can we come back? We really only have a, we'd only have a couple days to get that drafted and circulated. So I would suggest you plan to vote in February. We can have a draft for you next month. You're not saying that to support early release days. If you had an early release day, you could. If we only had an early release date, <laughs> this isn't orchestrated. That's is it? it. That's it. This was a setup. Like we'd be able to see out the cost. Yeah. Yeah. Because another question. Okay. So. So. Uh, I, I'm. We don't have to table it. I was. Just, so what would be the a January decision? I, I would suggest a February decision and a January that we plan to have a draft to you in in January that can be circulated for feedback and that. You take action in February. That's meant. The board is going to that. John, do you? Um, I think you made the first motion. Do you want to amend the motion? Uh, we just need to. You just. We just need to table it. Okay, so we'll table number um, yep. seven B. Yep. And all in favor? I don't. No, we, we don't, don't have to. Have to vote. Have to vote. Okay, so uh, just drop poll. Yeah. Everyone okay with tabling it? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's go to 7C. Consideration, um, can I have a motion? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I move that we uh, approve, sorry, the, the following policies for second reading, JLCA, JLCB, and JLCBE, and recommending for uh, deletion or removal, JLCC, communicable diseases. Thank you. And a second? Second. Thank you, John. And any discussion? Seeing that um, Joe is not here, Meredith, would you like to review? Sure. <laughs> so if you look at those policies, um, we had our nursing team review these policies as well as our district physician. And they also started with complaints from um, Drummond and Woodsum, our legal firm. And so you'll see some amendments in JLCA. They are primarily updates that reflect that we live in a digital era and that a lot of the information we now collect about student health is collected by our, our Power School um, student information system. <coughs> um, and you'll also see that we added under item six at the end of that policy. Uh, that the inf in, with respect to sharing of information with school staff, that we include but do not limit our inclusion to teachers, coaches, activity advisors, trainers, and bus drivers. So that we have the opportunity to share that health information with people who have a legitimate interest in that. That's still a requirement. But if, if you're chaperoning a field trip off-site and a student has an allergy, we want to make sure you have that information so that you're prepared to support them should an emergency arise. <laughs> JLCB um, was formerly only immunization of students, but we've combined that with the communicable disease policy, again, based on recommendations from our uh, Drummond and Woodson consultant, as well as review with the nurses. 
so the information that was in JLCC, which is recommended for deletion, has been incorporated into policy JLCB. And we've at, just updated a cross-reference to that policy um, to the Maine School Health Manual and the Chapter 261 immunization requirements. And then we've also updated JLCVE, which is the yearly immunization exemption form, in an attempt to make that a bit more clear. Um, we have a number of families each year at each school who request an exemption from the immunization requirements, and those exemptions can be requested for medical reasons, for philosophical reasons, or for religious reasons. So parents have to specify which immunizations they're requesting an exemption from, and they need to indicate the rationale for their request. Again, whether that's religious belief, philosophical reason, or medical. And if it is a medical request, there's, it's required that they receive a signature from their physician. Thank you. David? Well, I, I see requests for a waiver for like a sincere religious belief and for philosophical reasons. Am I missing the medical? The medical is at the bottom because the medical requires a separate signature. Who grants, from the who grants it? So the medical is granted by the physician. Essentially, they're granted by law, and the requirement is that a parent make that request and specify their rationale. So it's it's requesting a waiver, but nobody grants the waiver. So uh, essentially, it's already granted under law, but we we have to have something on file indicating that either the student has received their immunization or that they have received an exemption to that immunization. And, and this sort of bizarre thing is required by state law? Okay. It is bizarre. I think the intent is to make sure that students have the ability to attend school, whether or not they are um, receiving all of the immunizations that are recommended. And there is a provision in our policy that says if students have not received those immunizations and there's a public health outbreak involving one of um, the illnesses for which they're not immunized, that they may be excluded from school um, to reduce the risk to them uh, and further spread of, of the illness. Yeah. So uh, that is a safeguard that's provided under the law. The, the intent is to err on having children in school. And that's, <laughs> That's all I can tell you. Thank you. I would just, I was just, I really like this exemption form. It's very clear about the teacher responsibilities, and it's really clear to families if they're choosing to not immunize, their child may in fact be held out of school. Really clear when you sign this. So I, I applaud the design of the exemption form. That's it. All those in favor? It's a first. I said second reading. Second. second. Sorry. So. <laughs> I, I, John. Yeah. Go ahead, David. I, I just want to just to be technical, just yeah. for the heck of it. Um, the motion was simply to approve, and it should be the, the ones attached because the, they're changes. So I would okay. request that we amend the motion to approve the policies as attached to Section 7C. I move that we approve the, the policies um, as it, with the changes attached um, in Section 7C. JLCA, JLCB, JLCBE, and then the recommended removal of JLCC. Thank you. And second? I'll second it. Already seconded. So she just, in, in Re effect, revised. removed her motion and um, um, whatever the heck she did. Oh, you made me do it. <laughs> All those in favor. And John, I'm sorry that I didn't let you cover the policy as the new policy chair That's for fine. this year. That's fine. <laughs> Wasn't at the last meeting. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, 7D. Do I have a motion? Yes, I move that we consider to approve the nomination of, I'm sorry, I move that we approve the nomination of the new personnel for the 2014-2015 um, school year, including high school visual arts educator. Uh, Mary, Hart. Mary Hart. Mary Hart. Do I have a second? A second. Thank you. Any questions, concerns? Meredith? So just to remind um, the board and the public. This was a position that was um, vacated by the resignation of 
um, Jana Dewan last year who served as our um, second semester. She covered a leave of absence for us, but also served as the second semester ceramic teacher. And because that this course, these courses are only offered in the second semester, we made a decision to wait to advertise and fill this position until this fall rather than <coughs> doing that in the spring. Uh, Mary Hart worked for us previously as a visual arts educator at the high school. And so I would I would say it would be an understatement to say the high school is delighted to have her back. Mm -hmm. That's great. All in favor? One, two, six. Okay, 7E, do I have a motion? I move that we approve an unpaid leave request for middle school teacher Elizabeth Johnston from approximately January through April 2015. Second. Second. Any uh, questions, concerns, comments, Meredith? So, so again, um, part of this leave is an entitlement under FMLA and um, Ms. Johnson has requested an additional three weeks um, to <laughs> excuse me to stay home with her, her return after April vacation. She is a literacy strategist at the middle school. A point of clarification, um, is the entire leave unpaid or would she, there, she be entitled to the normal? She's entitled to her normal right. leave. It's the additional leave time that would be unpaid. So the additional Okay. Time. She's entitled to whatever sick time she has accrued. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. do not recall how much time she has available to her. Mm -hmm. It's typically, um, people are typically able to use roughly six weeks right. of right. maternity leave time. Right. Yeah, I just want to be clear that she can access that because yes. the motion says unpaid. So, okay. could, could I be slightly more technical? I have a question. Her sure. letter says from the 1st of January to April 27th. The motion is um, from approximately January through April to 2015. It doesn't match up. So, so typically when we're approving maternity leave, in this case, I'm not expecting her to come back after the December break, but we don't always know when the delivery date will be, and it is often the case I, that I was more concerned with the tail end than I was yes. the front end. Her intent is to return after the April vacation, um, which is roughly the 27th of April. She, she writes a nice, um, as a literacy teacher, and just as herself, she writes a nice letter stating that, of course, if there are any complications, she um, will inform us as soon as she, um, she will keep us informed on her dates and times. Yeah. Uh, basically, from, from the time of delivery under FMLA, she's entitled to, entitled to 12 weeks of leave, and then she has requested an additional three weeks. So the intent is, David, that that would start in January of 2015, but it's possible that that could start later, and it's also possible that it continue long, could continue longer if there were uh, complications. Thank you. <coughs> Any other comments, questions? All in favor? 7F, do I have a motion? I move to approve the, the uh, athletic Staff nomination uh, for Nordic Ski of Patrice Leary Forey. Thank you. Second. David, any discussion? So I'll just note that Ms. Leary Forey is a returning um, Nordic coach for us at the middle school. And um, I think she was persuaded to return because there was difficulty filling the position. And um, she had intended originally not to coach this year, was looking to sort of move on with her children, but agreed to come back and fill that need. So we appreciate that. <coughs> Any other discussion? All in favor? With a thank you to her. Uh, 7G. Do I have a motion? I move that we, <clears throat> excuse me, approve Nordic ski team trip to Stratton Brook Hut at Sugarloaf, uh, Kiribati Valley, Maine, December 28th through the 30th, 2014. A second. A second. Any uh, comments, questions, David? Yeah, I do. I, I probably should have done on the baseball on as well, but I've noticed for the first time that we don't have any and I'm curious about this, we don't have any requirement of proof of health insurance. It's not so much of an issue when, when it's an in-state one because anybody that has health insurance would be covered in-state. 
but there's a significant difference when you're in Florida as to when someone gets injured, whether or not they have health insurance. I know, for example, my, I'm required to provide a certificate of insurance indicating my son's covered while he's down in Connecticut going to college. And I would think we would, should require a similar thing for our out-of-state and even in-state athletic trips that they provide proof of health insurance. It's, it's not part of our policy now, I would assume, but I would suggest that we consider it because it seems reasonable. So that's certainly something the policy committee can consider and as a member of the I've already whispered appointed it. member of the policy committee. I've already whispered it to him. <laughs> and there is the um, mentioned earlier the, bo the the boosters are going through an insurance questionnaire. Uh, well, the, the only insurance required here is travel and cancellation insurance. And I'm suggesting a different kind of insurance, an additional kind. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, all in favor? Thank you. Okay. Are there any committee reports? Any committee members? Uh, yes. I'm. Uh, I guess as a buildings and ground and finance committee, uh, this uh, as those in the committee know, there was. Uh, Capital improvements plan developed uh, over a year ago, a 10-year plan. A uh, significant part of the plan involved uh, bond funding for uh, required non-discretionary capital projects ranging from uh, roof replacement to some electrical service facilities. Um, last night, the town council approved a $1.75 million bond request um, for projects that will occur uh, this summer. Uh, in the following summer, which is uh, obviously important, um, even though we're very happy and uh, I'm happy as a finance chair that uh, the bond request was approved. Uh, we just remind community that that's just one portion of uh, the, the capital improvements plan, a significant portion. In fact, the largest portion of funding will be through disciplined annual budgeting. So while we're, uh, I'm excited that we have the funding, I do think uh, citizens should, should expect, um, you know, significant or um, larger capital improvement expenditures in the budget of the next few years versus the prior 10 years. So we're happy it's done. I'd like to thank um, the superintendent, Greg Marles, the school board, uh, the town council, in particular Jim Walsh, who was very helpful in guiding the board through this, uh, Mike McGovern, and um, all those in the community and stakeholders who were involved in developing the capital improvement plan. So we're very excited, and this is one part of the long-term plan to maintain the assets we have uh, in the district. And then secondly, the Finance Committee um, budget season is upon us. Uh, we say this every year, or I've asked everyone in the community since I've been finance chair, um, you know, we always uh, strive to improve transparency and communications. So if there are items or information you feel as a citizen stakeholder that you would like to see us present in the budget or explain things in clear, plain language, please let us know. Um, it's difficult during budget season uh, to make changes in terms of presentation or information. So if there's items you would like to, to include or consider, Please forward those requests to the superintendent. Thank you, Michael. Any other committee reports? I'll just share for um, future evaluation that the newest, besides the workshop that Meredith talked about, um, we just in consultation with, will you exp uh, Sure. Dr. Um, Anita Stewart. Anita Stewart McCaffrey, who Thank you. Um, is a professor at USM and has experience as a school administrator and teacher. Um, as well as university professor is going to be working with the teacher evaluation committee um, to help move the process forward and her particular strength is around the student learning objective piece and working with teachers around assessment design so we're um, excited about her work with the committee and um, she'll be meeting with the student learning objective committee I think Tuesday the yeah, 18th Tuesday, I believe next week yes. yep. oh, <coughs> thank you okay um, number nine School board uh, agenda requests. And number 10, announcements of upcoming meetings. John, do you want to, uh, have you figured out when policy is? No, we haven't. Okay. We have, we have not set a time. Okay. Yeah. 
time and date for policy committee meetings yet, but we are working with all the members of that committee to <laughs> agree on a, a time. Thank you. We just don't want 7.30 Monday morning or... I think that's unanimous. Yeah. That was <laughs> unanimous. That's right. Um, we do have next Wednesday at 6.30 a joint workshop with the Community Services Advisory Commission and that meeting will be held at the high school library, our usual workshop site, but it is a different workshop date than usual because our usual workshop date is the Tuesday during vacation. Would have been the Tuesday during vacation. Thank you. <coughs> and number 11, I have a motion. I move that we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.